Hi guys, and I've got one spicy video for you here today. I'm going to be discussing the subject of the intermediate saxophone. Now, perhaps always considered the bridesmaid and never the bride. Well, I'm here today to set the record straight and explain the value of these often undervalued saxophones. Now, broadly speaking, I'm talking about saxophones with a market value of around £1,100 through to £1,700. That's in Great British Pounds, sterling, that is. Now, I've gone through all of the saxophones that we list in this price bracket, and I've picked out five key models, each one representing a different brand. My intention is to demo them all, compare and contrast them, and hopefully tell you something useful about what they all bring to the table. Now, before we get into this fully, just a word on the value of the intermediate sax. Why isn't it talked about as much as the likes of student instruments or upgrading to the best pro sax? And I think that there's a lot of psychology involved here. Kind of feels like by going for that middle ground, perhaps you feel you've fallen short of what could be possible. That by reaching for the stars, you could only grab the moon, perhaps. Um, but sometimes when it comes down to it, it's just a matter of the practicality of it. It may just be that it's too expensive, or perhaps you feel that you can't justify it. But whatever the reason, I'm here to tell you that there is huge value in these unsung heroes of intermediate instruments. When it comes down to it, you need an instrument to have a good tone, good intonation, a good key action, a solid build. And sometimes solid intermediate instruments can tick all of these boxes perfectly well. So it's not absolutely essential to go for those premium brands that I talk about you know, so readily in, in many of my other videos. So without further ado, I'm going to get stuck into these five instruments that I've got around me here. And I'm going to pick out um, some aspects, some key aspects that will hopefully make this video more concise and digestible, as it were. So I just alluded to it a moment ago there. The tone, intonation, absolutely crucial. Uh, the feel under the fingers and the build. So I'm going to start by just demoing them all, playing something similar on each one for obvious reasons. And then I'm going to settle into all of these individual issues and hopefully make it nice and clear for you. <laughs>
So starting on my left, I began with the Conselma Premier 380, and overall it's got this nice, powerful, big, bold sound with a certain gritty element in there. And it's always nice when you've got a bit of character there, so I like that aspect to it. Um, Resistance-wise, it had a medium resistance, something nice to push against. So it wasn't really free-flowing, but that medium resistance uh, just gives you, yeah, that nice middle ground, which I like in a saxophone personally. So that's the Con Selma. And then moving on to the Yamaha, this one is the most free-blowing out of them all for me. Um, actually, perhaps with the exception of the SR, which I'll come to later, but this one was slightly more free-blowing than the SR. Um, so I really like it from that point of view that you can just play anything on the Yamaha. The notes just pop out free and easy. Uh, Tone-wise, it's got um, a sort of soft undertone to it. Um, the, the, the softness just pops out immediately. But when you push it, it does turn quite bright, but it's a pleasant brightness. So it's an uncontroversial, nice all-rounded pleasant sound on the Yamaha. And then moving on to the Buffet, this one for me just has a bolder sound with a certain, what I would call a modern brightness to it, uh, without being overly edgy, perhaps a little bit of edginess in there, uh, but it certainly errs more on the bright side for me. And it's also got a certain amount of welly to, to the sound as well. When you push it, there's a certain punch behind the tone. Um, and resistance wise, it's got a medium level of resistance, so it's not really free speaking. You do have to, to move the air a little bit in order to get the response out of it. So that's the buffet. And then further around the arc, I have the P. Moriat, the Le Bravo. And this one's interesting because it, it um, borrows from the character of the flagship models above it, um, in that it's got that. Um, uh, interest in the sound, that texture in the sound, there's a lot of body there, um, but there's more brightness I think in this uh, Le Brava model than you get in those flagship models beyond it which have other elements in the tone. So just talking about this one purely, um, it has an interesting sound for an intermediate instrument, certain amount of character in there and a certain um, amount of power in there as well, which um, I enjoyed. And response-wise, it's quite free-blowing, but has a, a medium resistance uh, for my money as well. And then I alluded to it earlier with the SR, very free-blowing, so response is great. And the sound for this one is really interesting for me. It, it sort of takes off straight away. It's got a really singing-like quality to it. Um, um, you could say bright, but um, and, and there is a brightness there, but it's kind of coupled with this freedom, this laciness in the sound. Um, it just seems to respond well in all registers, so very enjoyable to play just from the tonal point of view. Okay, so next I'm going to move on to intonation, and I'm actually going to play another snapshot of each saxophone doing something slightly boring, but I'll try and keep it minimal. But I just want to point out how crucial this aspect is. So I'm talking about intonation here. Um, it's all very well getting carried away with the tone of an instrument, but it does nothing for you if that note is out of tune. You know, if you've got some particularly, say, flat spots on a saxophone, it might sound fine when you're just uh, mucking around with it by yourself in a room. But the moment you measure it up on a tuning machine, you realize that you're quite a few cents flat or then you start playing with other people and you realize that it's just not sounding good anymore and it's because you're out of tune then that tone just disappears out the window it becomes null and void it's 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 pointless unless you can actually get the saxophone as in tune as possible so it's a really key aspect um, in some ways maybe even more important than the tone of course you can't have a really poor tone but if you've got a half decent tone and great intonation then that is a good combination. But if you've got a uh, really poor intonation and a great sound, I'm afraid that that doesn't equal success for me. So I'm now going to just get into the intonation a bit on that basis. And what I've actually done prior to shooting, uh, because this is very important in terms of measuring the intonation, is I've checked out where the mouthpiece needs to be on the cork for each of these. And it's all at a different place because every saxophone has its own dimensions and what have you. Um, so it's really important that you set up the mouthpiece so that you capture the average intonation throughout the entire instrument um, so that uh, it's not just one note that's playing in tune, but uh, you're, you're actually representing 
you know, the value of the intonation of the, the, the instrument as a whole. And then it may well be that certain notes stand out as being a little sharp or flat. So I'll get into that as I play each one. Okay, well I admit that was actually quite tough. So starting with the Com Premier, actually first of all I should say, I was referring to a tuning machine down here whilst playing through all five instruments. And the tuning machine is a great device, but it, it can make you kind of go into yourself a little bit and um, just be totally obsessed with what you're seeing in front of you and sometimes forget your technique. Um, you know, it can stop you from breathing properly and, and playing outwards in the way that you would naturally when you're playing without the distraction of a tuning machine. Um, so always use these things with a pinch of salt, but at the same time, they can reveal all manner of sin. So they're very useful um, for showing areas of neglect in your own technique, but particularly when you're doing a test like this, um, they do show um, little nuances and that all the instruments have. So it's really worth me picking these out for you right here and now. So starting with this one, the Con Premier, um, it were, wasn't actually perfect. Um, around the low D area, it was on the flat side, good few cents on the flat side. So I have to really work to lip that upwards to get it um, hitting anywhere near the center. And then as you move through to the middle D and E, two other really critical areas of intonation, um, particularly on the alto sax, where um, they can um, be designed to 
sometimes just play on the bright, on the sharp side, I was noticing that the middle E was popping on the sharper side as well. So again, you have to adjust your technique to contain that and pull the pitch downwards on the middle E. Um, so it, it's, it's okay, but it's not perfect. You do have to work with it on the, on the Conselma. So that's that one. Moving on to the Yamaha, as you may expect for Yamaha, a lot better on the intonation front. You know, they're really known for producing instruments that play well in tune. You still have to work for it. You know, no saxophone is built perfectly in tune and the bottom end of saxophones is notoriously known for being on the flat side where you have to really work with the, uh, the breath support systems and making sure you're not too, too loose down here. So still on the D, I had to work to get that up to pitch. Um, but I noticed that it was particularly centered around those middle notes I just mentioned, the D and E, uh, were popping out nicely and in tune from that perspective. So very good there on the Yamaha. And then on the Buffet, um, again, a few areas of intonation neglect. I mean, I, I should point out that this instrument out of all five actually has the lowest value. So it only just creeps into this price bracket. Um, but it's still worthy of being included because it is a good step up model. Um, but just back onto the intonation side of things, again, similar sort of issues to the, the Premier where um, on the, the very low notes, you do have to push them to make sure that they remain sharp enough to be accepted. And then they can spike a little bit on some of those middle notes. So, you know, the middle E again. And on a similar trend, um, with the Moria Le Bravo, I found that this one also has quite a, a high middle E. It can be pulled down again, you know, once you've got all of this working, it's a case of relaxation in the throat, um, but it, it's a shame when you have to make a special effort for certain groups of notes and that middle E can often be an indicator of that. Um, so, whilst it's all playable and it is in tune, um, you do have to work in certain areas. And on the bottom D, I found that um, flatter uh, than, than most here, actually. So that's, um, yeah, one slight area worth noting for you. And then moving on to the SR, I found the intonation reined in a little bit more with this one. Everything felt a little bit more like the Yamaha, um, the, the, the middle E was a little on the bright side, but I prefer a note to be slightly sharper and for you to have the possibility to rein it in and play it in tune rather than be pushing against it, you know, producing that kind of shaky sound to try and get it up to pitch. And I found that at the lower reaches, it, it really was acceptable. And overall, the scale was, was pretty good on the SR. Okay, back to the left of the circle, we've got the Con Selma, and I'm going to now talk about the feel of the instruments going from left to right. So generally speaking, I like this, it feels quite smooth and solid. And the, the action's a little bit on the high side, actually. So the gaps between the keys and uh, where they touch down is higher than average. But that's okay. Again, it's just one of these things you just need to get used to it. Um, as a consequence of that higher action, um, I, I think I'm right technically in saying this, it means that with this auxiliary F key here, I tend to get a little bit stuck when I'm going from the B key onto it, just rolling on there. It, you can operate it, but it's perhaps not as smooth as you might otherwise like. But generally speaking, um, pretty pleasant key action there. Then moving on to the Yamaha, and the Yamaha comes into its own when we're talking about the key action. It's, it's light, it's quite a low action, which I really like. Um, no difficult areas at all. The palm keys feel very comfortable, as do the side keys. Um, the, the action is very smooth, there's, there's nothing spongy about it, it feels very even. Um, yeah, it's just ergonomically very sound. Well done, Yamaha. Um, on to the buffet. This one's interesting because it's got quite a chunky feel to it, it's almost kind of Carlworth-like in its chunkiness, um, which I quite like, um, although I prefer something a little uh, lighter, but some people do like that uh, heavier, chunkier feeling under the fingers. Um, so it's not like um, it's a stretch to get to anything particularly, it's just a little bit more stretch than perhaps the Yamaha when moving to 
some of the, uh, the, the table key areas, um, but it's just more the feeling of the chunkiness of the keys. Um, so it's a slightly heavier action, um, and but everything's reasonably well placed and nothing feels untoward. It feels quite well designed, it feels quite smooth under the fingers. Um, so generally speaking, um, quite good. Um, but yes, as I say, just a little bit chunkier there. So that's the buffet, and then on to the P. Moriat. Just remind myself again. Yeah, I, I think it's quite smooth, very rounded feel to, to some of these keys. Uh, the, the, the table key area feels nice as you're running your little finger over these keys. It feels like a nice transition there. Um, and it's a relatively lower action, so less travel time, so it just makes uh, everything feel a bit more nimble when tackling technical passages. Everything feels like it's in, in a good place. Um, nothing awkward there. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, generally speaking, a good action and well designed, so it feels very comfortable under the fingers there. Now, I particularly like the feel and action of the SR actually. Everything feels very comfortable for me in terms of placement of the, the palm keys. Um, nice and slender there to the hand. I think the buffet, I didn't mention it before perhaps, but they're sticking out a little bit more um, on the left hand palm keys for me. So you just need to get used to that a bit more. With this, it's a bit more slender. Um, and it's quite a low key action on the SR as well, which again, I like for you know purposes of technical passages and what have you, um, and very smooth as well. Um, so all very good there with the, the feel on the SR. So that's the feel. Now let's just, in kind of a related way, just talk about the actual build of the instrument. Um, so coming back to the Conselma again, um, it's actually, it's quite heavy, it's quite robust. We're looking here at double arms here on the lower notes, the usual suspect, just to give that feeling of um, solidity down here. Um, and it's got the strapping system, which is to say that all the posts are soldered directly onto these straps that run in turn down the body to give extra weight and solidity to the design. And you can feel the weightiness of the instrument um, uh, as you pick it up. It definitely feels like one of the weight weightier ones amongst the five here. So very solid overall in its, um, in its design. And it feels like a, a nice sort of strong alloy as well. So um, a good solid design there from Con Selma. The Yamaha, in a sense, contrasts with the Conselma in that it's much lighter. You feel it straight away when you pick it up off the stand there. And it doesn't have the strapping system, so the posts on this one are soldered directly onto the body, um, specifically to give you that lightness. You know, as Yamaha move into their higher level instruments, the, the, the 62, that's where they um, go big on the likes of the strapping system to give it a bit more weight. Um, but they see this as an advantage here for this instru uh, intermediate instrument that it, it is more lightweight and therefore, um, you know, it has the resulting effect on a more immediate sound and all the rest of it, as I mentioned earlier in, in the sound part of this video. But just in terms of the design, it doesn't mean that it's a poor design because it doesn't have the strapping system. It just means that it's, it's lighter in its build. I'm sure these posts are very stable in the way that they are soldered onto the body. So it's a little bit more lightweight. It doesn't have the double arms down here on these lower keys, um, adding to the, the lighter weight aspect of it. It's got a plastic thumb rest going on down here rather than a metal one, which I'm not so keen on. I mean, I could live with it, but I'd prefer a metal one personally. Um, but overall, it's, you know, it's gonna be quality metal. This is a Yamaha. They never fail when it comes to the build quality of these things. So that's the Yamaha, very good. And then onto the buffet. We're talking a bit more weight again here. Um, so it's kind of all singing and dancing really in some aspects. When you look at this um, just straight off the bat, you're seeing, I know I'm not talking about engraving here, but it looks quite a busy instrument. Look at all this engraving here on these keys. But we're also looking at fancy weighty key guards, double arms clearly here and here and here. And again, it's got the strapping system running down it. So that's adding to the extra weight. Um, but in terms of the build, it feels again, pretty solid. It doesn't feel like there's any loose parts. It feels like it's really well put together. Um, so a nice solid design, if on the heavier side. 
two more to go. We have the Lebravo, and this one is just a fraction lighter than the Buffet there. As I pick it up, I notice it feels a little bit lighter. Um, but again, quite solid um, in its design. The bell is, is on the larger size here, um, adding to its weight. It's not got the double arms here, so single arms there. Um, it's got the strapping system, which is again adding to, to the weight and um, perhaps the solidity of the design, of the build I should say. Um, but overall in terms of the way it's put together, um, it feels pretty strong. It doesn't feel like there's any sort of play in the keywork. It feels um, well constructed. Um, so that's, that gets the tick from me there. And then finally on to the SR and the way it's all put together. Feels like a medium weight to me, no double arms, but it does have the strapping system adding to, to the weight again of the whole instrument. And I've always felt that these instruments have been well put together, um, well designed. So, you know, no, nothing untoward to point out here in terms of um, it, its design. As I mentioned with the key work, which really is such a, a crucial part of it, it all feels really great under the fingers. So for me as a sax player, that's so essential. Um, so really that comes to the end of all my critique of all five of these. So what are my conclusions? Well, if I roll back to the beginning when I was talking about the sound, um, they all presented us with different sounds. Uh, but then, of course, the intonation is very much an integral part of the conversation here as well. And so I suppose when it comes down to it, I'm, I'm not going to start repeating stuff again because I've said it all before. But if I had to pick out a favourite or two, it would be the one on my very lap right now, actually, the SR. Just because of the impression that it left me with when I was playing it, that there's something f free in the way it speaks. It enabled me to, even though I was only playing for a few seconds, everything just happened a little bit more easily with it. And there was something enjoyable and liberating in the sound of it. And then when I checked it against the tuning machine, it, it wasn't bad at all. It was um, really pretty good in most areas. Um, so overall, this really gets um, a thumbs up from me. And then also, the Yamaha as well, the fact that its intonation is so good and its action is so fluid and the sound is so responsive, um, it, just may, it just means you're not fighting the instrument. You know, ultimately the saxophone is a tool and you need it to do what you command it to do. If you're fighting the instrument, then you can't perform on it, you can't play music, and that's what it ultimately needs to do. And I think if you're stuck um, on certain corners, such as intonation um, issues and nuances, then you don't really get going. You know, it can hold you back. And so we, I had a little bit of that going on, um, perhaps with these three here. But I'd also like to point out the merits of the Libravo and the Premier 380, because as I pointed out at the start, they do have really interesting tones, a lot of character there, and a lot of, um, interest to explore really when you start to get into the instruments. Um, so even though I mentioned these other technical aspects, sometimes just going for the sound alone um, can be really important to some players and you can work with the intonation, you know, it might be that you have to challenge yourself a little bit more to get it to work for you, perhaps experiment with different mouthpieces, etc. But if the sound is the overriding thing that you are going for, then these two instruments, the Libravo and the Premier, do offer a, a really good instrument. So I hope this has been useful to you. You know, when you're staring at all of these instruments on our website and you're wondering, what the hell to do because it can be very confusing. All the manufacturing blurbs are going to sing the praises of these instruments. Perhaps it's been useful to you to hear them all back to back and hear what I've got to say. I certainly hope it has anyway. Um, so without further ado, I'll catch you on the next video and thanks very much for watching.